Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Right Honourable Sir Andrew McFarlane, who is President of the Family Division. He's been that for some three months, I think. Prior to that, he was uh, at the Court of Appeal for around seven years. He's been a High Court judge. Um, he's familiar with the building, apparently, because he's involved in naughty vicars. Uh, he, he appears in the, one of the committees dealing with naughty vicars. I didn't know there were naughty vicars, but apparently there are naughty vicars. Um, but uh, he's extremely charming and extremely clever. Um, and it's, uh, I'm afraid to say you're, this is out of date because it doesn't get you up to the president uh, appointment. He has very kindly sent me the text of his speech, which we will put on the website for you um, later today. So you don't need to write down all his words of wisdom, but there, are, there is space here. So would you please join me in welcoming Sir Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was intrigued. You're all so keen. When, when Mark mentioned um, there was a question mark whether some of you might be here next year in terms of health, one of the experts, two or three rows behind me, said, well, I could set up a stall outside at the break and um, offer an expert assessment about whether each person is <laughs> likely to be here next, <laughs> next year. And now I've said that, one of you actually, actually will, <laughs> won't you? Um, uh, Mark said, I'm very clever. I've, I've never thought of myself as being clever. And, and at university, my degree result certainly showed that the university didn't think I was very clever. I didn't, I didn't turn up uh, very often uh, for the lectures. I had um, you know, educated myself more widely. Uh, and um, I think those who knew me then would share my astonishment that uh, now we had a sort of Doctor Who event in the family division and now, now I am the president of the family division, they would be very surprised as I am that I'm in this uh, position. Indeed, I can think of one of my law lecturers looking down on me now as I stand in this wonderful room talking to, to you. Uh, I can just picture the, the expression on his face. <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not dead, he was just very condescending. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> As a family judge, and now the judge in charge of the family justice system throughout England and Wales, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to address this conference and to say something about the role of experts in the family law jurisdiction, something about the role of experts more generally, uh, before concluding on a, a topic which may be of interest uh, to you, to say something about the radical changes that are being developed and implemented throughout uh, the court system and the tribunal's system, uh, criminal, civil, or family law, or any other of the tribunal jurisdictions. So first, expert evidence in uh, cases relating to children. I in contrast, I think, to uh, every other area of litigation, cases about the welfare of children will almost always involve some element uh, of professional expert uh, in the case, other than the, the lawyer or the judge. A family court judge, and by that I include uh, magistracy, uh, a judge is not a professionally qualified person to assess matters of child development or a, a child's emotional well-being or more generally matters relating to a, a child's uh, welfare. Uh, whilst the judge hopefully will have common sense and common knowledge, uh, the decision-making in every case where a local authority seek to take a child into public care or have a supervision order uh, will involve um, expert input from uh, a social worker employed by an independent agency, CAFCAS, uh, the Children and Family Court Advisory Support Service, and of course by the professional experts, the social workers in the uh, local authority. Uh, but despite that level of professional uh, input, uh, which is in effect the default situation, uh, most child protection cases and uh, many of the more intractable disputes simply between a mother and a father about their children uh, will also require the introduction of some independent uh, expert evidence. Uh, where a child is suspected of abuse, the family court typically has two questions to address. Uh, first, what has happened? In particular, is the child suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. That's the threshold test for taking uh, 
action to remove a child from parents? Uh, and if so, on the basis that the child's welfare is the court's paramount consideration, the second question is, what's the best plan for the child's uh, future? And, and unlike really every other area of litigation, which is looking back at what's happened and trying to produce compensation or punishment or a resolution, the family court's always looking forward in cases of children, uh, not only to decide what's happened, but what's going to happen in the future. Well, in answering the first question, what's happened, the court will not infrequently receive expert medical opinion. Uh, medical intervention, of course, might have happened at the very moment that it was discovered uh, that the child uh, had some uh, aspect of uh, concern. Uh, and the ordinary clinicians uh, might find themselves called as witnesses in the family proceedings. Uh, but such witnesses are, however, uh, despite their obvious medical uh, expertise, not treated as experts in the family proceedings. Uh, their evidence and the working diagnosis upon which their various interventions may have been based will be part of the factual background uh, upon which subsequently instructed expert medical witnesses may offer an opinion and about which obviously the judge may ultimately have to decide. Well, as I've talked about this work, child protection work, those of you in this audience who are unfamiliar uh, with it may have a basic picture in your minds of the sorts of things uh, that I am describing. But you would, I think, uh, be surprised by the range uh, and the scope of the cases determined in the family court for which medical uh, expert opinion is essential. Uh, there's not the time or the necessity to tell you uh, in detail about those uh, this morning, but I can anticipate, uh, you can imagine, the spread of work that runs from cases of neglect on the one hand through to cases of sexual abuse and cases of really serious physical injury. Each of these broad categories of case, however, uh, will often generate subdivisions of complexity requiring uh, expert intervention. In cases of neglect, for example, there will perhaps, uh, by definition, be no one single precipitating event about which the court uh, can focus. Uh, no individual example of parental failure uh, may of itself uh, be categorized as significant harm if we're in a neglect case. And so in such a case, the expertise of a pediatrician to look at the impact on the child of the months, and it may more probably be years, uh, of inadequate parental care will be necessary. In addition, in determining what's happened uh, and whether the parents are able, despite previous inadequacies, to care for the child in a safer way in the future, it will be necessary to understand why the parents failed in the first place uh, and what might be put in place to support them to bring about a change so that if they have the child back in the future, they will then behave differently uh, and in a more protective way. Well, here, expertise in drug and alcohol abuse, including, of course, determining whether the parent has uh, abused drugs and alcohol, uh, experts in learning disability, mental health, and general psychology uh, and well-being may be of importance. But more generally, uh, in all cases of child abuse, uh, whether it's a physical injury or, or, or something else, uh, the need to understand the potential for significant emotional harm to the child has gained prominence in our courts in recent years, uh, to the extent that the court may well turn, in most cases, to the expertise, certainly most serious cases, of a child and adolescent psychiatrist or a child psychologist. Where the allegation is of physical assault, expert witnesses will be required to advise upon not only the precise mechanism of the injury, but importantly for us in turn, determining uh, if something's happened, who's done it, um, the timing, the timing of the assault. Uh, where the assault leaves no external signs on the child, for example, where it's thought a child might have been shaken, uh, or there's been attempted suffocation, or salt poisoning, or indeed any of the other bewildering uh, array of extraordinary parental behavior that parents sometimes um, uh, act out to generate symptoms in a child in order to gain medical attention, what was uh, called in the past certainly factitious uh, illness, the court will typically have to hear from a whole range of medical experts in order to determine uh, each aspect of the child's condition to understand in a global way uh, what 
uh, on the balance of probabilities has happened. Although the overall context within which this work is undertaken, namely that of child abuse, is obviously depressing and at times emotionally draining on those of you who do this work and those of us and the lawyers and the social workers, they, they are cases of, I think, the highest importance for not only the specific child and the family, but for society uh, in general. The stakes are high. If the judge is wrong, then, on the one hand, the child may be removed for life, go for adoption, when the parents are wholly innocent and have not done anything uh, that uh, might be uh, culpable. Uh, conversely, uh, the child might be returned home to a home that was, in fact, uh, abusive. The medical and scientific interest also in these cases, for example, a contested shaken baby uh, case, is, uh, I think, of a high order. Uh, these are genuinely important and interesting cases, and the family court is most fortunate in attracting experts of the very highest caliber in a range of specialties to give evidence uh, uh, to assist us. Well, having, I hope, uh, said sufficient to interest you in the scope and importance of the area, I want to say something briefly about the nuts and bolts of being an expert in the, the family court. First, and in a way which, uh, again, marks it out from other jurisdictions, the need to avoid delay in concluding proceedings relating to children is a matter that the court uh, affords uh, priority to. Uh, common sense dictates that if a court takes 12 months or more to decide what's going to happen to a child, uh, then if you're an 18-month-old child, for example, that level of time, that level of delay is wholly uh, unacceptable particularly, as normally, uh, the child will be living for the time being in a temporary foster home from which he or she will move either back home or, or off uh, somewhere more, more permanent at the end of the court process. The need to avoid delay is in fact embedded in the Act of Parliament, the Children Act, uh, and Section 1-2 says, quote, in, in any proceedings in which any question with respect to the upbringing of a child arises, the court shall have regard to the general principle that any delay in determining the question is likely to prejudice the welfare of the child. And as welfare, as you will know, has to be the court's paramount consideration, it follows that the avoidance of delay is afforded a priority. Obviously, instructing an expert who's new to the case is something that will take time. The expert has to be found, has to be instructed, and then has to take time to consider her or his uh, uh, opinion. But delay in the system, as it was three or four years ago at the time, or five or six years ago at the time of the government's uh, family justice review, of which I was the, the legal member, was running at the order of an average, an average of 60 weeks in these child protection cases. So imagine if you're a one or two or well, really any age child to have to wait well over a year before you knew where you were going to go uh, is itself damaging, fresh uh, material happens to you and the question of where you go becomes all the more uh, conflicted and, uh, and complicated. Uh, the recommendations of the Family Justice Review uh, were that uh, experts should only be instructed where it was necessary for that to happen and that the timetable of the court should dictate when the expert report uh, was delivered and the choice of expert had to fit the timetable rather than in some cases uh, the other way around. And that recommendation was accepted by the government uh, and implemented in Section 13 of the Children and, Family Courts, uh, the Children and Families Act 2014. Uh, and that provides that no person may instruct uh, an expert for use in children proceedings, firstly without the permission of the court, uh, and uh, uh, unless the court allows uh, that to come in late in the day. Section 13.6 provides that the court may give permission for the instruction of the expert, and this is the test, quote, only if the court is of the opinion that the expert evidence is necessary to assist the court to resolve the proceedings uh, justly, end of quote. And the rules of court, part 25 of the family procedure rules, uh, give more detailed uh, provision. But the message is clear. The family court maintains a very tight rein, both on the decision to instruct an expert in the first place and then the timetable for the submission of that evidence. The second observation to make uh, is about uh, the context in which the expert evidence comes to the family court. Uh, 
It's in contrast to most other forms of civil proceedings, partly because the funding uh, for most expert instruction uh, comes from public funds, legal aid or local authority funds, rather than the private purse of one or other of the litigants. Uh, whilst uh, where a judge has held that the instruction of an expert is necessary, the legal aid agency will not normally question the fact that an expert is instructed. As you will know, the rates payable to experts have, with the passage of time, been grossly eroded. Prior to my appointment uh, as president three months ago, my role as a judge in the Court of Appeal had taken me away from the, at the front line, as it were, uh, of court uh, cases and in the instruction of expert. So coming back now with my eyes uh, freshly attuned to what's going on and having observed the operation of the family court at first hand once again, I've been struck by accounts from courts all over the country as to the greater difficulty that they say now exists in finding experts who are prepared to take on instruction in family cases. And again, the survey uh, which Bonsolan and the Times conducted, which was published yesterday, uh, demonstrates uh, that there is a really marked uh, line between those of you who are prepared to act as legally aided uh, experts and those who aren't. Uh, this is, uh, I've discovered, a particularly acute problem in the field of paediatric radiology. There never were a lot of paediatric radiologists, uh, but now those who may be available uh, are not uh, able to be instructed readily in the courts. Uh, and also, more worryingly and more generally, uh, there seems to be a reduction in the number of uh, paediatricians who are willing to become expert evidence in the family court. Having now, in these last two or three months, become aware of that problem, I intend to do what I can to understand why this has occurred. The provision of high-quality professional expertise where the courts held that that expertise is necessary uh, so that the issues can be determined justly is plainly essential. If the tightening up of the regime for instructing experts that I've described, in combination with the freeze in the rate of pay, has resulted in the supply of expertise drying up, then these elements in the operation of the family justice system may need to be looked at again, and I intend to do so. One area where I think you all may agree, whether you've been in the family court or indeed any other court, uh, is that in terms of case management and timetabling, insofar as it impacts upon your experience as an expert, uh, things could be done better. Uh, sometimes, one hopes, and one hopes many times, uh, things do go according to plan, and the expert arrives, doesn't have to wait very long, comes in, gives their evidence, uh, uh, and goes, all according to plan. But when things do go wrong, as they do, the experience from the expert's point of view may be very negative. Uh, and unplanned timetable changes made by the court may have a disastrous impact uh, on the expert's own professional diary. Uh, I'm sure that this is an area that, that requires uh, addressing now, just as it did seven years ago, and just as no doubt it will uh, in years uh, to come. But as I will explain in the closing stages of, the, of this address, there is some ground for hope uh, that the environment in which you may be giving your evidence in, say, two or three uh, years' time, uh, will be uh, very different and markedly more beneficial to you and your timetable. The role of the expert more generally. I wish, if I may now, to speak more generally of the business of simply being an expert witness. Uh, many in this audience are expert at being experts, particularly if you've been to every one of the 24 conferences that Marx put on. And my word, you must be saints, mustn't you? Um, <laughs> I have no wish to... No offence, Mark. No. <laughs> I've certainly no wish to te teach you how to extract the runny part of the egg through a tiny hole in the, at the side, but I do offer some observations based on now nearly 40 years of experience. Three, three short observations. First, quote, uh, only put your hat where you can reach it. That's a maxim that I've put together, but it's drawn from a very clear memory of a delightful West Indian bus driver, now some 30 years ago in a court in Birmingham, striving to explain to a judge that he lived, it was a case about the family finances, always lived within his means. And it stayed in my mind down the years. Uh, asked by counsel whether he was an extravagant man, uh, this delightful individual said, Your Honor, I never put my hat where I cannot reach it. And the judge believed him. I, I'm not sure I did, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
But as an expert, you will, side, you, will, you will find that one side or the other, more probably both sides, will try to push you to move your opinion in one direction or another. Indeed, that's probably the experience of every expert in, in every case. Uh, at all times, you should be clear that it's your opinion that you're giving and not the opinion of anyone else. Uh, in your mind, you should at all times take ownership uh, of what you are saying in your evidence in the state of only, in the, in the, um, by only stating that which you're professionally comfortable in saying. Don't be tempted to adopt a position which you cannot then justify rationally on the basis of the evidence in the case, the learning in your special area which is relevant to it, and your own professional experience. So don't put your hat where you can't reach it. Number two, avoid being blatantly partisan or too dogmatic. I mean, it's, of course, n none of you hearing me say that will, will feel you are, but it, sometimes with experts, it comes across in that way, and it really is very damaging to that expert's uh, credibility uh, and to the, the case uh, more generally in terms of the judge's ability to rely on what is being said. Uh, an expert, conversely, who's ultimately disagreeing with the alternative opinion, but can properly accept parts of that opinion uh, of the alternative uh, analysis as being access acceptable before then explaining why they disagree, is a far more credible uh, expert in my view. Uh, such an expert will be much more impressive and a more valuable witness to the judge uh, when compared to one who simply toes one party line or another or holds unflinchingly to a particular theory, refusing to countenance any other alternative uh, cause or case. Three, in judicial circles, it's a well-known phenomenon that some lawyers who hitherto have been entirely amiable and mild-mannered individuals subtly develop but immediately develop following their appointment as judges to the bench uh, the wholly unattractive arrogance and belief in their self-importance that we call judge-itis. Uh, catching Sir David Foskett's eye over there, and I'm sure he's, he's nodding and we can name one or two um, people that we, that, that we know. Uh, whilst I've not heard of anything called expert witness-itis, uh, I have over the years seen a few examples of seasoned expert witnesses who previously had been highly regarded by the courts who've become so used to giving evidence and having their opinions accepted by the higher courts that they've become extravagant to a degree that's moved them well away from sound scientific uh, basis uh, and, and uh, the, the sound scientific basis that had hitherto underpinned their valuable opinions. The most striking example of this is sadly Professor Sir Roy Meadow, but there are others, uh, more than a few that, that I can recall. Hubris, in my view, is no friend of the expert witness and is to be uh, avoided. Mark has asked me uh, to explain what the judiciary expects of experts. Well, well, having spoken about hubris and knowing that what follows is entirely my own opinion as a single judge, I'm keen to point out that what I'm saying is not speaking for the judiciary uh, as a whole. It's simply my view, which I offer you uh, this morning uh, in order to help you generally in your work. Uh, and I've been able to distill it to simply uh, one word, uh, and the headline word is clarity. That's what we want, essentially, from you. It's taken as read that you're an expert, uh, that you have learning. That's why we've asked you uh, and instructed you in, into the case. So once that's happened, clarity is the key thing. Uh, and perhaps in two senses. Firstly, clarity of thought. No matter what your field of expertise may be, you're likely to, be, to have been brought into the case because it's not straightforward. Indeed, it may well be extremely complicated. Time spent by you as you're working in what the military will call reconnaissance, before you commit a single word to paper or a single word into what becomes your uh, report, I would think is likely to be very well spent. If you have a clearly thought through view of the detailed evidence in the case and your professional perspective on it uh, so that you've undertaken and really completed the thinking that will underpin your opinion before you start writing your final report. That report is likely to be much more valuable uh, than it otherwise might uh, be. To describe the contrary, it's not uh, unusual, I'm afraid, to encounter an expert report 
where the initial section runs to many pages, often very many pages, in which the primary evidence, which the court knows because the expert's drawing from the very documents that the court has, is simply regurgitated in a manner which seems at that stage to afford each element an identical value. It's simply uh, put down. It is a landscape without any contours. Only at the later stages of such a report may the reader begin to discern that which the expert considers to be important before glimpsing the finishing tape where the expert's opinion is finally uh, stated. A senior family judge who's now retired uh, once told me that he always wrote the concluding paragraphs of his judgment before writing anything else. This seemed to me entirely contrary to what I did, and I probably am guilty as a judgment writer of this sin that I've just described to you in terms of experts. Uh, but what he did uh, was to uh, think the case through, and then when later, having written his concluding paragraphs, he came to set out the summary of the evidence, he knew which parts of the evidence were going to be important and which were not. And so when he set out his evidential summary, uh, he accordingly gave uh, appropriate prominence to the important material uh, rather than simply stating everything uh, uh, in a, a bland uh, and repetitious way. Clarity is also important in a second context, and that's clarity of explanation. Uh, whether in a written report or oral evidence, the aim of every expert witness must be to explain um, their opinion clearly uh, setting it out so that lay readers, judges, witnesses, barristers, or, or whoever uh, can understand it. Here, a paragraph or two setting out the basic science, applicable if it's a case involving science to the point, uh, or a professional context, is invaluable uh, in my view. So too, uh, in a case that turns upon explaining some physical uh, or scientific um, uh, 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 process, is the odd photograph or diagram or other image. In this regard also, I would suggest that less is more, in the sense that succinctly worded but clear short paragraphs will be more valuable than densely worded discursive text. In like manner, a decent sized font, <laughs> good spacing and clear open presentation in the report is something that most weed readers will dearly cherish uh, and admire in your presentation. The same applies in the witness box. Uh, at first blush there, the expert witness may feel that he or she is in less control, but the need to hold on to the goal of clarity uh, is as important as ever. State your opinion and where necessary give short explanations for it. Here an example just as a photograph or a diagram in a written document may be particularly enlightening. But always be aware that the questions you are being asked by the barrister uh, are the barristers, but the answers, the evidence, is yours and yours alone. Take and keep control of your own evidence. Think before you speak. Give the answer that you want to give from your professional perspective, and unless you're comfortable in doing so, do not give the answer that counsel's question otherwise entices you to give. Finally, the radical changes that are taking place in the courts and the tribunals. It's about three years ago now that the judiciary, um, HM Courts and Tribunals Service, HMCTS, and the Ministry of Justice came to an agreement for a very radical reform program, that's what it's called, reform, uh, designed to modernize every single aspect of the work of all of the courts and all of the tribunals. The overall budget is set at around 750 million, but most of that money is not new money. It comes from savings made uh, in real time now by closing and selling some buildings and centralizing some processes, and savings that are uh, assumed to be made by the more efficient running of the courts once the program is in place. It is the biggest change program being undertaken anywhere in government uh, at the moment, and it's being undertaken while we're trying to carry on delivering business as usual for the cases that are in the system. So it's a big uh, program for us, uh, and you will encounter, if you do, court staff and judges uh, who not only are doing the day job, but are in a uh, more stressed situation because change is stressful. Uh, and at the moment, we're at the stage when the, um, the downside, the closure of some buildings, the removal of some staff, 
uh, and the rationalization of sitting is taking place, but the uh, positive changes, the new kit, the new working environment uh, has yet to be uh, delivered. I suspect most of you won't have been aware of this change uh, at all. Uh, those of you who appear in tribunals may now more regularly be sent not to a bespoke tribunal centre, but to a magistrate's court or uh, a county court where a hearing room has been set up for you. That sort of experience will develop uh, more and more. Uh, in Sunderland, where I was last week, um, the magistrate's court has been completely refurbished and now is a tribunal and county court centre alongside the magistrate's court. And it looks good. There are flexible rooms in which uh, uh, different sorts of the jurisdiction can be undertaken on different days uh, and therefore uh, allowing the buildings to be used uh, more uh, thoroughly and more fully uh, than was otherwise uh, the case. Two of the core changes that are being uh, worked on are likely to impact upon you, uh, and they are these. Firstly, the aim is to move across all cases to paperless hearings. Uh, secondly, uh, and separately, the development of virtual hearings where none of the participants is in the same location as any of the others, uh, but all are connected to the judge over the internet. I'll deal with paperless hearings uh, shortly. They will be facilitated by digital bundles, bundles as you know are what we call the ring binders of uh, paper. Uh, as we approach the third decade of the 21st century, it is something of a no-brainer to suggest that courts and tribunals should now abandon our reliance on each party and judge working from ring binders, often many ring binders of paper. Digital bundles have been used for some time in big commercial cases and in the criminal court and in other areas of work, but they will now be the norm uh, everywhere. Their introduction will coincide with all of the court processes, people making applications, filing statements, issuing an order, also being conducted on, online. Pausing there, the one thing that's come out so far is divorce petitions. Um, I've had to occasion to, to try the new process, and it works really well. I'd recommend if you've got an idle moment on the train uh, on the way back, whether you're married or not, frankly, uh, log on. <laughs> log, log on and ha have, have a go at um, uh, filing a divorce petition. To, once, you, <laughs> once, once, you, once you get going, it's, it's fairly addictive. You, <laughs> it's a bit like fix odds betting. You, you move on to the next date. And, I got a long way in divorcing my wife the other night. <laughs> and it, it was only when I had to pay the fee at the end that I, I held back. She would say that's typical. But, um, <laughs> but seriously, have a look. It's a modern, so we're all used to doing stuff online now. And, and what uh, we've got, and this is the first product, they're all being developed slowly, bit by bit, learning from mistakes. It works. Uh, and now I think more than 50% of people who issue divorce petitions do so online. The error rate, the kickback rate from the court where people had failed to file the right document, filled the box in incorrectly, of the paper system was 40% was sent back. Uh, the error rate of the online process is 0.5%. Uh, 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 and so moving to the paperless uh, process where the whole bundle will be on a WinZip file, I think has obvious advantages for experts. Uh, you can be sent the bundle, it can be on your laptop, uh, you can access it uh, wherever you are. You might be away at a conference or whatever. You've got a report to write. And instead of lugging everything physically uh, in papers that have been delivered to you by DHL, uh, you'll have um, the documents uh, with you. I remember when ring binders first came in. It was I started practicing before photocopying when the fax machine was only just being invented. And, and we didn't really have all this, this paperwork. And you'd go to court with just a little batch of papers. And I was against a a barrister, James Oral, now a retired judge, one day doing a small case in Burton-on-Trent County Court. I had, a, I had a quality practice in those days, and um, James had his papers in a little ring binder file with a few post-it stickers on it. I said, James, that looks really good. He said, yes, he said, it's very good. He said, this makes the solicitors think I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing him, I think that was why he did it. But <laughs> Secondly, the virtual hearing is, is more of a radical departure. Uh, much will, of course, and you'll be ahead of me on this, depend upon the quality of the kit 
Uh, the kit we've got at the moment is antiquated, uh, but assuming that the kit will deliver what's required for the right type of case, uh, a fully or partial uh, virtual hearing is likely to be efficient, uh, effective uh, and economic as a way of conducting court business. From the perspective of, of an expert, uh, I strongly suspect that the ability to give evidence remotely in some cases will be very welcome, even if the rest of the case is carrying on in a conventional way. Your ability to join down the line on proper modern kit uh, will be, I think, attractive, particularly if you are uh, a long way physically from the court centre, and it will reduce the amount of time taken out of your diary travelling to court and sitting in a, a waiting room. But more subtle advantages will, I anticipate, become apparent as we get used to the new environment. Uh, and I offer one example drawn from a case now some years ago where it was necessary for us to hear from uh, a highly experienced paediatrician uh, over a, a video link. The evidence was complicated uh, and the process of giving it took a day. Uh, but the expert was in an office uh, with a large conference table upon which he'd laid out all of the key documents in places where he knew where they were and where he could find them. And instead of being confined to the witness box and dealing with the, the physical court bundle, he was able to walk around the room, uh, pick up and demonstrate uh, documents or quote from them uh, as he wished. Uh, in addition, uh, being a techie person, he was able to patch his laptop into the video link. And so much as a lecturer might um, uh, change a PowerPoint slide, he could uh, switch the picture from a picture of him to something, a diagram, a medical note, or something on his computer. Uh, my strong feeling at the end of the day in court was that rather than being disappointed that he hadn't turned up uh, in person, the process of giving evidence down the line was in fact far more effective uh, than uh, him being in the witness box uh, in the more conventional way. Who knows? But it will be a, a different world uh, in which you come to encounter us and we encounter you in two or three years' time. I hope I am right, and I'm genuine in this, in looking forward to these and the other reform changes. If they result in a court and tribunal system that is fit for purpose and compatible with almost all aspects of uh, modern life apart from the court service now, then the success will certainly be welcome and will do much to remove causes of frustration and delay in our current system. But whatever the result of the reform process may be, one thing is, I think, absolutely clear. We in the courts and tribunals will continue to need and to rely upon valuable contributions from you in terms of sound and seasoned expert uh, evidence. It is a genuine pleasure to be here today and join your conference and to have the opportunity, which I now take, simply to say thank you. Where would we be without you being available to join in our processes? So thank you for all that you do and for your continued interest, which your present here, presence here demonstrates, uh, your continued interest in enhancing the ability of expert witnesses to deliver evidence uh, and the analysis which we in the courts vitally need. Thank you very much. Sir Andrew has very kindly agreed to take questions from the floor, uh, but I wondered if I could perhaps ask a question first, if I may, please. Um, I was concerned when you said perhaps justice is not being done because experts were not willing to come forward. And one can see the reasons. We have Jones and Caney, liability and contracting negligence. We have reputational damage. We have timetabling issues. Um, uh, and ultimately the fees that they're paid. And I know you've only been in this role for some three months or so, but do you have any idea how you're going to solve this issue of not being able to get the right expert at the right time? Uh, I think primarily I need to find out from those who do this work precisely why it is uh, that they uh, aren't engaging with it. Uh, I think the fees have never been high, no. uh, but we had a body of people who saw the the value and the need to sure. engage, and that's, that's gone in, in well, it's certainly gone to the degree that um, it's now noticeable that, that it's being eroded, and I need to understand quite what that is. It may also be that the environment of giving evidence in court, the adversarial nature of the process is unwelcome uh, to experts, and I think there may be a range of matters. So I intend to engage with the various uh, Royal Colleges and other 
other bodies and particular experts who we can identify who no longer come, who used to come, uh, and then see what can be, can be done. I mean, if, it's, if it's rates of pay, that's not within my gift, but if it's rates of pay, I'm more than willing to flag that up uh, to um, the Ministry of Justice. Uh, I hope that the new environment may be more I I inviting, but I suspect there's a range of difficulties that have just led um, individuals to say, well, enough, yeah. and it's, um, I think it's a fairly complicated picture. Thank you. If you have a question, perhaps you raise your hand. Uh, there's a microphone. Uh, could you just give us your name and field of expertise, please, sir? Hello, Sir Andrew. Uh, Chris Walklet. I'm a partner in a county firm. Uh, I do valuation typically in civil cases and uh, family law divorces. Right. Uh, well, firstly, thank you for your thank you. But coming back to the Judge Artis comment, um, anecdotally I find that there's a lot of evidence that judges see expert witnesses as a frustration, an irritation, and a can't you two parties work this out yourself? Why do you need to put forward a bloody expert witness? Which, when that gets fed back, can actually be quite demotivating and makes the expert witness feel a bit devalued, even though they work with the best intent. So what would you, what would you say to that? that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I mean, if that's your perception, that's, that's clearly happened and happening. But I'm surprised by that, partly because um, it, I'm talking about children cases the judge has decided it's necessary to have the expert. So that, that feeling probably doesn't occur in, in children cases. But in, in money cases, where people are uh, rowing about money in the divorce, uh, again, the courts had some, some control because we don't want to be overrun by, uh, you know, I'm not going to use your phrase, but <laughs> unwelcome uh, in introduction of expert evidence. Um, so that, that surprises uh, me. Um, so I can't, don't think I can really answer it because I don't have a handle on why, why that should be the perception. I'm sorry. There's a question there. Thank you. Robert Sells, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a general surgeon. Looking back on the latest kerfuffle, particularly about um, uh, criminal action, but in the courts against supposed criminal activity, by uh, uh, negligent doctors and the erosion of the uh, status of the General Medical Council in respect of their role in terms of ticking people off and taking them off the register. <coughs> and then going back to the Meadows case of seven years ago and the consequent really serious erosion of our concept of immunity in the courts. Putting those two scenarios together, do you think that the prognosis for um, the, the availability of uh, expert views on the really difficult cases that you have been talking about in which is your specialty, do you think that prognosis improved as a result of that? That the GMC may be a, a bit more lenient when it comes to thinking about relieving uh, the duty of uh, the expert with regard to immunity particularly? I think, I think all of that contributes to the uh, unwillingness of people to put themselves forward as expert witnesses. It's, a, it's an even um, uh, narrower tightrope that you now have to walk to avoid um, complaints or more, even more, more burdensome processes against you. Uh, but that, uh, I hope, shouldn't deter the expert who is competent and confident that they can walk uh, that, that, that narrow path. Uh, I don't want to comment on individual cases or certainly on the, the GMC processes, uh, but I'm, I'm sure all of these things that you mentioned achieve massive publicity and they're read by certainly everybody in this room and it must impact on their, their willingness to engage with us and it makes the, the whole process from our side of engaging people to give expert evidence uh, more, more difficult and the experience that I've, I've described. But I would hope that there are still uh, experts and there is still the ability for experts to be engaged in the process without uh, falling foul of um, the various um, trips and hazards that now uh, are all too plain to see. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say we're going to have to move on to our next speaker. So could you please join me in thanking Sir Andrew very much. Thank you so much.
Very nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel will take you.